the reality is that the urge to draw, paint, carve, sculpt, uh, our existence has always been a part of being human. It's something that you can find with every human culture in the world. Having an impairment, that is a loss of physical or mental function, which is what being a disabled person is, uh, has also always been part of being human. In every culture, there have been disabled people ever since time began, really. How do these two things fit together? Well, a quick look around the world. This is a carving 23,000 years ago, which was found in Europe, or here, a person of short stature in Egypt 4,500 years ago. Astava Kra, who had his legs and body bent in eight different ways, is a Hindu figure. A Peruvian vase of someone with Down syndrome, uh, learning difficulties, a lateral salter, showing, which was done nearly 700 years ago on a manuscript, shows people uh, with different walking aids. And here we have a picture from the 1980s of a carcass in a wheelchair. What that is trying to show is, you know, are we just lumps of meat that people stare at? No, we're not. But uh, that was the point that the artist is trying to make. So if we go now just to looking at Europe, then the Roman Empire, you might have seen the film Gladiator, but they also trained people of short stature or disabled people or blind people to fight so they could laugh at them, which we wouldn't think was very funny today. These are short people who are boxers. There are also many good luck charms, if we can put it that way, of short people or someone here with a scoliosis, which means a hump on their back. At the end, you have the Emperor Claudius, who's thought to have had cerebral palsy. To start with, the Senate in Rome, ancient Rome, didn't want to appoint him but the Praetorian Guard, the Emperor's Guards, put him on the, uh, as Emperor. And in fact, he was quite a good Emperor, even though he was a disabled person. In fact, people's attitudes about disabled people are often proved wrong. But even in the sculpture, you can see that the toga is covering up his left leg, which was distorted, uh, and so they cover it up. When we come on to the medieval times, about 1,000 to 800 years ago, we find this, uh, their biblical stories, particularly in Europe, of Christ or the saints curing people. If only it was that easy. You know, people still go to places like Lourdes to get cured in their wheelchairs and on their crutches, and they come back on their wheelchairs and their crutches because miracles are not that common. Uh, but it was seen throughout this time that that was the only answer. And of course, many of the pictures from that time show us the parables from the Bible. This is the uh, Epithera, the man with a broken spine who Christ just sort of touches and then he can take up his bed and walk. Or here, a, a stained glass window in York of a Saint uh, William who uh, just touches a woman and she can suddenly see when she was blind. Or here, carrying a relic of Jesus who, this is his, the Holy Grail, what he was put in when he died, uh, which was for many years thought of as, as a very important relic. And notice there the guy with the walking stick who couldn't walk before, but now because he's touched the Holy Grail, he can carry this heavy thing. So we see, and even when it comes to mental health problems, you might not think there's many connections between curing people of demons Having just had Halloween, you might have been thinking about some of the demons around. But these little demons you can see coming out of people could well be uh, what we would today think of as people who had mental health problems, but the saints were curing these demons and then the people were cured. Two of the greatest painters of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci, painted the Mona Lisa, and uh, Michelangelo, the sculptor of David and other things, and you can see them both there, are both now thought to be autist on the autistic spectrum, which is quite interesting because they were very much obsessed with what they were doing. They didn't have many friends, or any friends really, and worked a great deal focused on a particular thing. Um, we see from this time that most of the pictures that we see are of saints curing people, the lame, which is people with physical impairment, or the blind, which is an insulting thing, but again, both being cured. This is quite an interesting one. Henry VIII, you probably all remember him. He's the man who had six wives and changed England from being a Catholic country to a Protestant country so he could divorce his wives. 
Uh, but part of his household, in those two windows at the back there, there are two people who are not princes or part of his royal family. They are the court jesters, and these were people they called natural fools. These were people with learning difficulties, and they were held in high regard at the Tudor court because the Tudors believed that people with learning difficulties always told him the truth, which is maybe true, and they had a direct link to God, so they would always tell you exactly what you needed to hear. This was his favourite painting, and of course the people in it, were some of them were dead at the time that this painting was. So it's not a real painting, it's constructed of what, his favourite wife and his three children. And they were never all together in this way as grown-ups. But that was how he liked to think of, of his household. Another thing that developed from when the printing press started, around uh, 1480, Caxton invented printing based on things that had come from China or in Europe. And it was possible then, rather than individual paintings, to print large numbers of things. And as most people couldn't read in Europe at this time, pictures were used, engravings, uh, etchings. And this is called the dangers of love, where you see the lovers in the top picture there embracing but then all sorts of demons and other things come along and at the bottom they've got crutches uh, covered in sores and then that isn't the end of it, then various goblins and other people punish the lover, particularly the man, and in the end he goes off in uh, a chair, a carried chair called a sedan chair with a blanket over his head and where is he going? He's going to the insane asylum. So this was really a, a warning to people not to love too much because maybe this might all happen to you. Cartoons were also important uh, throughout this period from when printing came along. The first one there is Mitelli, uh, 1630. This is for laughing at disabled people. This is a school of painting of short people, or as they were called then, dwarfs, painting someone with scoliosis, or as it was called then, a hunchback. So that was paint drawn for last. The next one was to show weakness. This is Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, standing up, drawn through heaven through a chariot, and being attacked by the Dutch. He went to war with the Dutch again for religious reasons, and uh, being having the crutches is meant to be a sign of weakness. The next one, a, a painter called Hogarth, who did a lot of cartoons. He featured a lot of disabled people in his pictures usually showing them as useless or hopeless. Again, not true. Uh, and this is a character that you would find around the streets of London then, called Billy in the Bowl. And he's opposite the wealthy and good apprentice where everything in his life is going well. Or well, this one, when the Napoleonic Wars were being fought uh, 200 years ago, more than 200 years ago, John Bull was meant to be Britain. So he's a fat guy there, well-fed, goes off to war, has all sorts of problems, and when he comes back, as the British, he is weakened, and so he's on crutches. So again, being disabled is shown as a sign of weakness, which it's not true. Or rich people are going to a place called Bath, where they took the waters, and this is a, a cartoon based on them racing and all falling over each other. And to come up to date, this is probably the only one that most of you will recognise, the Marvel comics, which have all been made into films. This is Batman. One side of Two-Face is good, and one side is bad. So again, no prizes for guessing which is which. So the one with the facial dis distortion, a disability, is the bad side. So this is a long trend that we've had, and it comes down to shaping our attitudes today towards uh, deaf pe uh, disabled people. Goya was a Spanish court painter, very important man. And he painted uh, the royal family and various other people, but then he got depression and he became deaf. And his paintings took on a much more harsh view, particularly with the invasion of Napoleon of his country and shooting people. And then he, the death of reason and this horrific painting of Satan eating his own child, which was called the Black Paintings, which perhaps we would think was a bit racist today, but that was how we, they were characterised then. <laughs> People who are blind or visually impaired were also artists. Rembrandt, you may have heard of him, very good painter, uh, living in the 17th century, but he had eyes that looked in different directions. So when he saw things, he did, and if he's got 30 portraits of him, you see his eyes pointing in different directions. This enabled him to do these great big canvases that he painted, 
but he also was very sympathetic to disabled beggars, of which there were many in Holland in that time, because leprosy, a small bacteria that spread and there was no cure for, uh, was going through the population. And lepers had to wear a white headband, which you can see there, and uh, they had all their worldly goods taken away from them. Or Monet, who was linked to the beginning of Impressionism, he used to paint his garden, the water lilies and so on often. He had a bridge in his garden, which is called the Japanese Bridge, but through cataracts in his eyes, clouding of his pupils, he could hardly see it. So you can see his pictures later on are not at all the same. The same is true of an American artist called Georgia O'Keeffe, who did abstract art. But then as she was going blind, she did this rock to symbolise how she could no longer see, and she ended up telling people how to paint her pictures because she couldn't do it anymore, and then as a potter. Or Degas, another famous artist, you can see the difference in these two pictures on the right because uh, by that time he also was going blind. But of course there's no reason if you're a blind person like this Scottish artist, Keith Salmon, he's blind when he painted this picture and he's blind when he painted that picture. He's painting from his memory many years before when he could actually see. Perhaps the most famous disabled artist some of you will know about is Frida Kahlo, a Mexican socialist artist who believed in the culture of the Mexican people. And she had polio, which I had when I was a boy, but she also had a rod from uh, a, a crash, went right through her spine, and she was in pain and in plaster most of her life. But that didn't stop her painting how she felt, and she's very in vogue today. Even the Prime Minister wears a bracelet of Frida Kahlo. I think there's a lot here you'll agree which perhaps we don't automatically think about, but the world of art is a reflection of human society, and what the point I want to end on is that the attitudes that are out there, which we all have to battle with, and in this school you're better at dealing with, I think, than in most places, have a long history. That's where they come from, and most of them are based on lies and distortions, and we have to challenge them when they come up. Thank you.